honorable and perfectly self-enlightened worshipless Buddha consummated in knowledge and behavior. Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on air number 133. The third in a series of Dhamma conversation with Venerable Dhamma Gavesi from Sri Lanka and UK on all aspects of the Dhamma here under the Four Noble Truth and the Noble A Full Way. And you are indeed welcome. Thank you for your attention. Friends, what is this fundamental right awareness? That noble eightfold way leading to Nibbana is simply this. Right view, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right awareness and right concentration. But what is right awareness? The fourfold definition of right awareness is 1. Awareness of the body merely as a transient and constructed frame. 2. Awareness of feelings just as conditioned emotional responses. 3. Awareness of mind only as a habituated and temporary set of moods. 4. Awareness of all phenomena only as constructed mental states. Right awareness is of these four while being alert and clearly comprehending. This will put away any longing towards and any aversion against anything in this world. The Blessed Buddha once said, Friends, this is the only direct way to the mental purification of beings, to the overcoming an elimination of all sorrow, all frustration, all pain, and all misery, to gaining the right method, to the realization of Nibbana, that is, this establishing of exactly these four foundations of awareness, these four great frames of reference. The core concept is thus. These four foundations of right awareness are 1. Being aware of the body only as a transient form or frame. 2. Being aware of the feeling just as a reactive response. 3. Being aware of the mind merely as a passing set of moods. 4. Being aware of any phenomenon solely as a mental state and nothing else. Friends, awareness is indeed a mountain of advantage. The explanation of acute awareness and clear comprehension goes like this. When inhaling and exhaling long, one notices and is fully aware of just that. When inhaling and exhaling short, one notices, labels, and is fully aware of just that. One trains, I will breathe in and out clearly comprehending the entire body. One trains, I will breathe in and out calming the breath and all bodily activity. When walking, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is walking. When standing, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is standing. When sitting, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is sitting. When lying down, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is lying down. 
going forward, one notices and clearly comprehend this going forward. When returning, one notices and clearly comprehend this returning. When looking in front or to the back, one notices and is clearly aware of just that. When bending or stretching, when lifting or carrying, when eating or drinking, chewing or tasting, one is aware and mentally labels just that, bending, bending, chewing, chewing, eating, eating. When passing excrement or urine, one clearly comprehends exactly that. When falling asleep and when waking up, when speaking or keeping silent, one notices, knows and understands exactly that and clearly comprehends that this is what one is doing right there and exactly right now. Continuous awareness of purpose, suitability, domain and nature of one's current behavior with a mental, verbal or bodily activity is right awareness and clear comprehension. The characterization of right awareness. Awareness of wrong view or right view present now is right awareness. Awareness of wrong motivation or right motivation is right awareness. Awareness of wrong speech or right speech now is right awareness. Awareness of wrong action or right action done now is right awareness. Awareness of wrong livelihood or right livelihood is right awareness. Awareness of wrong effort or right effort at this very moment is right awareness. Awareness of wrong awareness or right awareness is right awareness. Awareness of wrong or right concentration right now is right awareness. The function of right awareness and its associated mental states. Knowing right versus wrong awareness as right versus wrong awareness is right view. Exchanging wrong awareness with right awareness is right effort. Right awareness has the function of observing, noticing, remembering and knowing the true reality that neither any body nor any form no any feeling, no any mentality, no any phenomena, no any mental state is real, lasting happiness, nor truly attractive, nor lasting, nor satisfying, nor something to be kept, nor even personal. All phenomena are momentary. They pass away right at the moment of their arising and occurrence. Nothing is permanent. Everything is in a state of flux, arising and ceasing, emerging and vanishing, coming and going, again and again and again and ever again. Continuously seeing these transients, this impermanence, and thus this dissatisfactoriness and impersonality is right awareness. For further study on right awareness, Sammasati, go to whatbuddhaset.net and search for awareness. Thank you. So in that way, 
to do so, Bhante, you need to have a discipline in a way. The, sure. The, the, the seal must be a little strong. Mm. Otherwise, you, you tend to give in, give in, give in, then mm. suddenly that this, this mm. relaxed uh, uh, attitude comes in. Uh, uh. So, because of this, you have to start building up some sealers inside mm. you mm. and then to hold on to the sealer, be determined with the sealer. And, and, and this, this is why the Pratyaveksa is such an important thing for monks. Mm -hmm. yes. mm. So, in this way, the practice has got encouraged because it's no longer a hour's occupation. Meditation is not for hour. Mm. It's the other 23 hours that he would be worried about. Mm. And this one hour he may be relaxed. Mm. <laughs> so, so, you say, uh, this mindfulness and this clear comprehension of what you are doing uh, in each particular moment, whether whether at night or at daytime, this is a central uh, core of the practice of your personal practice also now. Yes, man. So, so you try to administer uh, this mindfulness and clear comprehension of what you are doing, whatever it might be, for the, for 24 hours. Yes. Uh, around, huh? Yeah. Uh, in uh, cycles of 24, because it the cycle of 24 hours month it brings daylight and darkness. Yeah. And because this daylight darkness comes, we have a way to attack or, or, or deal with daylight and deal with mm. darkness. Mm. So because from the day we were born mm. till the day this body dies, we are either awake, and if you are not awake, we are asleep. Mm. True. So realizing this, this cycle gives you that. Mm. To, mm. be, to know whether you are asleep or not. Mm. And then to understand that from the day we were born till the day this body dies of us, that the posture is one of four postures. Either you are in motion, standing, sitting down or lying down. Mm. So, oh, it's a good thing to be aware of these four things. True, I think. So, sure thing. in that way, if you take Satipatthana and start building Satipatthana into your life, it becomes that occupation. In itself. In itself. And yeah. you do not then have to find something else to do. So therefore, you, 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 you leave aside... It's a job in itself. It's a plenty of job. Yeah. This is exactly what yeah. Satipatthana is supposed to yeah. do. Yeah. It needs to occupy your life. It needs to entertain your life. And it needs to take away this karma mm. in your life. Mm. It needs to take away the akusalas in your life. Mm. Mm. And, 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 you know... Uh, Akusala, we can say, is the detrimental or disadvantageous mental actions that you right. do before you do something physically. Right. So, when he explains Satipatthana, that, that this Ekainoya Mango Satthana Nisuddhya Soka Parideva Samadikam, it just explains this paragraph in your life mm. when you start doing this. Mm. I can add up uh, myself, my own practice was like this. So, say, uh, I'll typically get up at three and then I will... Uh, do uh, internet work until 5 and uh, some correspondence also and then I will sit down and meditate then 7.30 uh, I'll get up and start to uh, to go breakfast but going out of the going out of the bed and approaching the kitchen or it can be the, the toilet then I will note whether I'm stretching an arm uh, whether I'm taking this and that whether I'm bending an arm whether I'm sitting on the toilet uh, whether excrement is coming or not uh, how I use the paper how I have to get up. So slowly, step by step, just being aware of whatever I was doing at that particular moment. And then try to maintain that uh, on a daily basis, day long. This is, of course, difficult because as soon as you become captivated by uh, some, some uh, external circumstances, it can be as, a, as innocent as a, a bird singing, or it can be that you're, you're uh, being entertained by what you're doing. For example, a job, you're do, performing some job, and then suddenly you you lose it and you do, you do not become mindful of what you are actually doing. Yeah. You become an uh, autopilot. And whether you are painting or, or you are riding a car or whatever, or you are on the job, as soon as you see an uh, autopilot, then this mindfulness, this clear comprehension of what you are actually doing, in particular, the, I would say, the mental actions, what you are thinking, what you are feeling, uh, which is a part of the four foundations of awareness, huh? What are the mental states, the Dhamma that is uh, flooding you from from time moment to time moment? This is, a, a, as Banda say, it's a job in itself to keep track on it and to keep tracking it down, to yeah. keep tracking it down all the time, all the time, all the time. Yeah. However, one can say as a as a price, the number of mistakes you do uh, goes drastically down. 
basically you make no you make hardly any mistake if you're aware uh, but you are wandering from one mistake to another mistake if you're not aware yeah. because you're wandering as we say with your head under your arms basically and we hold on arm in Danish huh? so wandering with your head under your arm you don't see what you're doing you don't think about what you're doing and in particular as Brenda pointed out this a very crucial discrimination is it advantageous is it kusala is it something that promotes a good future or is this akusala is something that accumulates bad karma and something that accumulates a frustrating painful future what is it can you make this or is it neutral can you make this discrimination for each particular action whether it's a mental action thinking a thought uh, or is a verbal action saying something eventually it can also be saying something to yourself or it's something that you are doing for example imagine going to the toilet uh, or uh, cooking or doing the gardening and so on and then suddenly one will one will uh, see if one uh, practices on a prolonged period then one optimizes once uh, doing so one start to do it in another way and one do it in an advantageous way just doing it mindfully actually is advantageous in itself so so this practice you can become uh, is can become daylight as Bendis points out uh, just being aware a very easy one is these four postures being aware ah, now I'm sitting this body is sitting uh, now this body is lying down uh, now this body is uh, moving is running or walking Ah, uh, now this this body is standing. So just keep tracking of that. This is four very very simple thing. Everybody can do it. Even a child can do it. Huh? I would say even a dog can do it. Huh? Animals can do it. But in praxis, uh, because you lose it, then it's it's not so easy as it should be. It, it seems to be a simple task, but it is not a simple task <laughs> to keep track on it. Huh? From moment to moment. You you lose it suddenly you become unaware sitting the, here under this talk we have lost it a billion times huh? we were not aware we were not aware we were sitting down of course we knew we were sitting down but we were not aware of it because we were aware of all kinds of other stuff yeah. huh? so their mind goes out blah 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 and then uh, it runs out the tank it however to, so it's a very simple praxis to establish this mindfulness but it's not an easy one and it's not something that can be maintained over time over time so so as Ben say it's a major job. In itself, to keep track on what are you actually doing, and right? how is this body composed? This is a praxis, huh? Exactly right. So, going back to this world, this conventional world, this society that we live in, this month I was asked to go to a kindergarten, yeah, uh, four, five-year-old children, and said, teach them meditation. I said, yeah, no problem. How long do you want me to do that? Yeah, long as you can. I said, yeah. I said, I would like the children outside. And took all the children to the gate and stood them. Pavement and the road in front of them. Uh, this Pante was saying, right? Moment you see a car coming from this side, put your hand up. And the moment you finish seeing the car, put your hand up. Then that, that, that was the exercise. Hmm. And the children waiting for cars to come to put their hand up and waiting to see when they finish the car seeing beginnings durations endings upada titi manga that was enough for hour or so the children were waiting for the cars to come to pass them and not to see them interesting very simple task Exactly. But not so simple as it seems. Mm. But those children are able to do so because their mind is not corrupted. Mm, mm, mm. Their yeah. occupation is that they give the occupation, they do so. Mm. But we want to offer them toys, we want to offer them food, we want to tempt them with so many different things, thinking that that is the way to entertain these children. Mm. Don't think so. Mm. But respect. The parenting respect this world because they're trying uh, it's a hard job mm, mm. and they're doing a good job mm. but there is something better that we can afford mm. to our children to calm them down to bring some sense into these people to just expand on it if you take that to the four postures to see the beginning the middle at the end huh so one one exercise could then be to say 
uh, when do you sit down? And when are you sitting down to note the, the, that now you're sitting down for a prolonged period? When do you stop sitting down? And the same thing with lying, with walking, with talking, with keeping silent. As someone see all the, the three things, usually in the start of uh, establishing a, awareness, one only see the beginning. So one doesn't, one, as soon as you have seen the beginning, ah, you know the beginning. But then you, you keep sitting down, you don't know the presence of the same state for a long time. And also, because you have already forgotten your, your mindfulness, then you don't see the end. Yeah. Don't see the end. I think actually, especially regarding pleasant feeling, to see pleasant feeling go down. So you, everybody can see it come, you take some soft eyes, there's some sweet taste on your tongue, and then you have pleasant feeling. So you see it arise. So, so to, to see also, is it stable when it's there? No, it goes away as soon as uh, the taste on the tongue it reduces of the sweetness, then the pressure goes away. It gradually fades away. But then also see it disappear, that it, it evaporates into oblivion. Uh, and then suddenly there's no, no pressure. There is maybe a, a, faint, a faint aftertaste of this sweetness, but there's no pleasure in it. Then one tries to, immediately one will realize, as soon as you see the end of it, or the end of it has come, then you usually take a one more spoon. One more spoon. One more spoon of samsara. Then one more suffering, bite of suffering, huh? eventually. So one doesn't realize that this, what one do realize by seeing the beginning, middle and end, yeah. that that the ending, to see the ending is what sets free, what sets free. Because then you see also, ah, now I re-begin, I re-begin, I re-initiate whatever pleasure-seeking it is. So, to, to, to whoever who's listening to this discussion, as a beginner, if you can learn the simplicity to start seeing anything begin and end, it may not be its own beginning, but it is the beginning you have made contact with and you then stop making contact with. Seeing that beginning and ending is a cultivation of some practice that will make you, give you in, with any teacher, doesn't matter who the teacher is, this will give you the foundation to listen to those teachers and to put into practice what they are instructing you to do. Learn to see the beginning, existence and the endings. It doesn't matter if it's not its own beginning. Like when those children mm. were seeing the car, mm. the car started long time ago. Mm. It's gone a long journey before it came to these children. Mm. But it is the time they made contact with it. Mm. And they stopped with it. Mm. And that is their mindfulness. Mm. The car has its own journey. Mm. Don't know where it came from, don't know where it is going. Mm. But these children knew exactly at that time, it's in front of me. I saw it, continued, ended it. One thing I have been fascinated by myself, and which is also a part of the, part of the classical practice, is to uh, what object you can take. You can take a car, of course, you can take your arm, you can take your leg, and your whole body, whether you're sitting or standing. But one thing you always have with you is your breath. So I have for a number of years looked at my breath to see the start and see when I, with this inhalation, when it's continuing and see then exactly pointing out exactly where the end is. And this is an interesting, uh, the, the commentaries to this particular exercise says that there are somebody who can see the beginning, but they cannot see the middle, they cannot see the end. Then there's someone who are naturally prone to see the end, but they don't see the beginning and the middle. And then f for all of these beings, and myself included, then it has to be an exercise to say, ah, not only will I see and notice the beginning of the inhalation, I will also notice that now it is still there, I'm still inhaling. And this subtle end that I, when I stop inhaling, I will also see. Then one realizes it's, it's not a simple exercise, but it's very, very acute teaching because this breath is with you all the time. It's all usually not perceived, but easily perceivable. Yes. Easily perceivable. It is always there. It is free to, to look at. And so it's a wonderful exercise. Yes. Even when it goes fast, you can also do it. You can also do that. It is more easy. Huh? Yeah. Huh. Uh, we covered uh, a lot of ground. So, uh, so what you're saying is that this uh, mindfulness, this awareness, is something that has been a, a core part of your praxis. What then, I would say, uh, uh, 
what do you think has been the main effect or the main uh, positive uh, outcome of of this mindfulness establishing this mindfulness my thinking my attitude towards what this world may have been in the past of how i may have recognized this world is no longer the world i used to recognize the world is the same but you are now you are perceiving another world so true huh? as, as pre previously it is something that in reference to this body in reference to the way i choose to recognize something i recognize it so what changed it is near self that uh, if i look at something the distance as to what i'm looking at is a measure from my eye to that object So this physical body is the reference to whatever that this world was for me. Hmm. The left and the right is only because this body has a front, and in reference to the front, a left and a right is made. Hmm. A top and bottom is hmm. Hmm. front and so in this way, the totality of the association of what this world is made has changed. Hmm. Second thing, what this help. to do was to remove a convention of naming uh, if he used to wear a shirt he now unpicks the shirt into pieces it's been brought together momentarily the word shirt goes away because now there's only pieces but the pieces that made the shirt is there but the shirt is together is not there mm. so he began to realize that how ingredients are brought together put together and named constructed Constru ah, mm. that that construction process so therefore what this mindfulness or the slowing down has done is to assist to undo this social world so recently there was a gentleman who came to talk about this and said bante now that you have realized all these things what happens if you when you go back now into a conventional world to apply this so sir very sorry to explain to you this way by the way that world that you're talking in the convention doesn't exist anymore yes because ah. to come here he had to undo that mm, mm. so the roles have been undone the clothes he wore has been undone mm. in that way the world this bunty used to contact with had to be undone to come to where he is okay so there's so, nothing going <laughs> no no you cannot go back to it there's nothing going it's impossible yeah. but now let's so let's say uh, the person uh, before uh, was naming was seeing this shirt as a shirt and that it makes sense there was also this so social conventions with shirts yeah. you have to wear them they have to be clean and they have to same thing with a car yeah. uh, uh, with a bank and so on but suddenly your focus is set what i'm saying your focus or your interpretation of what this shirt is and what this world is that is something that has brought to been constructed that has been put together and therefore inherently also that it will fall apart yeah. uh, this has changed yes. this has changed so the whole purpose is uh, not to engage in it now because it, it, eventually it will fall apart exactly it's so false yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay okay yeah. so it, it, it is the falseness because if you can undo that thing yeah. well, what, what are we doing yeah. Yeah. So, so, so uh, you can say when you say world, the physical world, uh, as the person who asks you, uh, is of course can be can be the same, huh? Yeah. But it's one's own world, own interpretation of the world, and thereby the personal purpose of being in it that has completely changed. Exactly, one day, and, yeah. and 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 it it, it it just goes into so many other things, emotions, mm. right? Take roles. Mm. Everybody is a person. person with a name mm. but that person is a person only because they have roles mm. but not everybody who has a role so males have certain roles females have different roles children uh, yeah teachers so, exactly so, yeah, so bosses you know, like a male person becomes a husband but a female mm. becomes a wife mm. and what you as a wife do is not what a male person does as a husband mm -hmm. yeah so mm. so therefore you, you remove those roles 
and suddenly you see the self mm. so naked. Mm, 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 mm. So you mean as soon as you put on this role on yourself, you identify you with some some social function. Then this the whole social convention of what a father should do, a mother should do, a child should do. Uh, this will uh, lock you up in a prison. Then you have to do it. So true. You feel you feel like this. I have to do because uh, this is basically what I do. This role do. Yeah. Uh, uh, uh. And 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 and, and I, I want to be the best father. Mm -hmm. and, and and not only that. I, I, on, the best on, pupil. I, on 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 Father's Day, Mother's Day, I want to get a, you know saying best mom card and yeah. Uh, uh. So you, you know, 360 days of the year, you you mm. work towards this one card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Because that, that, that is how society measures us. Mm. And it becomes such an intensive occupation. And we do not know a life beyond a rule. No, 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 no. So this poor world, this conventional world, is Caught engrossed, up. Yeah. engrossed, lost mm. in role. Mm -hmm. And whoever in society uh, uh, values certain roles. Today, people try to seek those roles, mm, mm, right? Mm. So then they can hide many things, occupy themselves mm. and, 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 and get lost. Mm. So, so do you feel, this I feel is strongly that the, the monkhood, monkhood is not to take up another role. It is rather to say all these conventional worlds that is in the conventional world, uh, they, they, I, I will turn my back and walk away. Uh, and not take up upon a new role uh, or a new meaning or a new view that is something to sense to say and then I I will uh, reject to some extent all the roles all the roles yeah. of the conventional world yeah. you have to associate with the triple gem so in associating with the triple gem you have to identify yourself as the Sangha mm -hmm. so to be the Sangha you have to be a bhikkhu or a bhikkhuni upasaka or upasaka so ultimately, this cell ends up in that one identity mm. with the Buddha mm. and not with a mother or a father, mm. not with no convention of family. Mm. Right? Mm. They're there. Mm. And mm. all what it done is remove your role that uh, belongs with mm. the relationship. Mm. I would just say, okay, you have a you are called monk and you are called bhikkhu, huh? yeah. but I would say uh, the, the purpose of being a bhikkhu, or being a monk, or a nun for that sake, is to give up this role also, huh? because uh, at the moment you attain nibbana, then you will not be a bhikkhu, you will not be, have any, you will go to a place or enter a state that cannot be designated, basically. So there is no role, there's no internal, external, no, there's no past, present, future, there's no physical world, there's, it's not a location, so you cannot you, you cannot point out a role whatsoever at that so, particular point. You and me, yeah. our next stage is what you're talking about. Mm. For the conventional world, mm. and the people who are in this convention, who now has to associate with the Dhamma, to come here, they cannot leave their name and their identities with role and just be. No, true. So they have to come to this stage because the teachings of the Buddha is for bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, upasakas, upasikas. So they have to become that. Only then they can receive the teaching. They have to become a disciple. disciple. So once they become the disciple, in that disciplesness, what you just explained is Sabbe Dhamma Anattati. Mm. There is no self in, in the Dhamma. No, so no, therefore, no. There is, you remove this role. Mm. And, and that's the next stage that you have to do. There's a noble way, but there's nobody seen walking it. Huh? Uh, it's so, a process. So, if our discussion is to talk with other bhikkhus, then mm. we should be talking about that stage. Mm. If you're talking to the social world that we're talking with, to them, you have to give them that association, that identity, that this self, from where you are, in that multitude of roles, you just come to being a upasaka upasika. You listen to and take up whatever that is needed for your teaching to the journey. And after you get there, that calmness will give you the stage to see outside. Mm -hmm. So uh, now we've gone to the praxis. Huh? Uh, we have not spoken so much about the sila, but, but I think maybe also because uh, this is for, this is also be, should be meant to be kind of like a little bit an introduction, but also a potpourri of what the Dhamma is. Uh, we should talk a little bit about the entry. So, uh, how do you see the five precepts uh, for, for importance of this praxis and this path towards Nibbana? Yeah. 
extremely important and the importance but the initially is not what each one of the sealers are about first is the realization of what the phenomena in the sealer is about it's about the negative connotation associated as in weight without yeah hmm. so when you take on board that i will not kill and a promise inside you before you take the promise you are faced with a choice to kill or not to kill is a choice we have naturally in this world hmm destroy your god hmm the moment you take this promise on board this sealer on board first thing that goes away is this choice we have we relinquish this choice this is something that is not spoken much in the sasana no true true yeah. true so but the person who takes this on board and now knows how to adjust their life always to do to participate in the physical world making sure that what you do what you say is not destructing another's life is not participating directly or indirectly in any killing exactly yeah okay so you say before before you make this choice then there is two choices huh yeah sometimes you can kill and sometimes you don't kill yeah but so the job is to say ah now i'll choose not to have this choice not to never to let this choice be open yeah. never to, to take away this possibility exactly. of killing exactly so accepting only non killing yeah. only non killing because that is the first stage you need to get to to come to the middle path hmm. because hmm. when you talk about majjhima patipada the middle path he talks about the eightfold path hmm. in this in the eightfold path as an element of sila in that element of sila there is the the right speech right action and the right livelihood mm -hmm. and if you take just the right speech it says musawada vera man mm -hmm. it's about not saying any lies anymore mm -hmm. so you have a choice to lie or not to lie and the one who takes and how to exercise this is that they have to relinquish their choice mm -hmm. so again so here you say ah okay now i have a choice in each moment whether i want to say something to say something that is partially or wholly false or i have to have the choice to say something that is uh, absolutely true then one should relinquish and take away this choice that is left open all the time that maybe sometimes under certain circumstances i will say something partially false yeah so now how you approach this is what's important because the one who tackles these five elements one with speech three with um uh, action action one with like the other yeah so what who does this bhante would come to a point where the variety of the pleasurization of breaking one of these things is removed from their mind hmm. and the consequences they carry of the bad consequences unwholesome consequences they carry are gone hmm. so when you go back to the eightfold path and go back to the concentration and the first concentration accomplishment of concentration vivichcheva kami variety of pleasurizations vivichcha akusale variety of unwholesomenesses savitakkam savichara the one who has found a resolute nature to reduce these two things they have viveka piti sukha patamak dhyana comes to the first accomplishment they have joy they have all the five factors we just we just i just like to say the, the five precepts is to say first to accept the training rule of not killing to accept the training rule of not taking what is not given i think it's better to, than to say not to steal yeah. not to take if it's not given to you okay. then you don't touch it you don't touch it basically and, and not to abuse anybody or misbehave anybody in seeking sense pleasure here on the sexual pleasure and not to speak false musawara not to walk with falsehood by any means not to pretend anything and thereby also the last one is not to intoxicate that is not to drink alcohol and not to take intoxicating drugs that cause carelessness so these are five choices as we say and i would say a large part of commercial life uh 
actually goes against these five. Just think of the whole drug industry and alcohol business, but also the entertainment, uh, the pornography and so forth. The, all the killing that is, uh, that is uh, make, made heroic on the entertainment on films, uh, is where all these weapons are, are branches. It's a, it's a whole thing that goes against this. But uh, as a Buddhist, is Buddhist said it's a lifeblood. And also, I think for me, it has been uh, of value to say, ah, if you are, if you want to train generosity, which is the first mental perfection, then what you, when you take this choice of not killing, then it is the greatest offer, the Buddha said, to the world. You say, now you can trust I won't kill you, but the mother and the father and the friend and the insect and the bird, they can also trust, ah, this person, he won't kill me. And this is very, very basic. This is a very, very basic trust that you have when you have other beings that at least they won't kill you and that they won't eat you. Huh? So this is a very big offer that you are giving indiscriminately to all. Ah, you can trust me. I won't kill you. I won't do you any harm. I won't lie to you. I won't sexually abuse you. And their friends and their mothers and fathers, they can also trust that. Huh? Exactly. So uh, what the Buddha says, the result is, for example, if you don't kill, then, then you get protected. You get your fair share of a future where you won't be killed. And if you're harmless, then you get a fair share, your fair share of a future where you won't be harmed. So it's also a form of protection yeah. one gains. Huh? Uh, uh, the, result, the opposite result is that if you speak false, at the moment you start lying, people will start lying to you. Yes. And so it, it is extremely uncomfortable. You don't know what's up and down. Huh? People tell you this story, this this story. You can never, you can never say what, whatever, what are they to, because they can fool you. Huh? So, so what, what can you do in a, in a social sphere? You, you're basically blinded and lost as soon as this, uh, this lying game has started. But if you keep your own, uh, <laughs> your own precepts clean, then they will feel uh, spontaneously. Uh, and instantaneously, they will feel under obligation of speaking the truth too. So this means that they will stop lying to you. And then uh, th your, your whole life becomes much more easy because now you don't have to think about, uh, uh, do I, are they fooling me or not? <laughs> How can you know huh? if they're lying? How can you know? Very complicated. Huh? They can be uh, have a poker face and so on. You, you don't know. Uh, so it's a, it's a big value uh, it's this, that one gives an offer. One is offering the entire cosmos and all his beings this protection that you won't kill them, you won't harm them physically, you won't lie to them, you won't deceive them, uh, taking them down the intentionally taking them down the wrong road. You won't abuse them or misbehave with them or any of their friends and family, yeah. and you won't intoxicate. So you become a foolish with if you're a doctor or a policeman or a healer or a monk. You won't intoxicate, so you fool them with, with foolish things that, you, that that are careless, basically, and maybe even also false. Because as soon as you intoxicate, then one sees ah, then then you also start to lie, then you also start to kill, then you also start to harm a little bit because you become careless. So the the precept goes together in one room. We say it's the lifeblood of the sangha, lifeblood. So Bansi, what you just explained in the Pali term, it says atto rakanti paro rakati. So if you protect yourself, know that other people are protected because you have taken a vow not to harm another. Rakati, Rakati. protect. Protect them. Yeah. So ultimately, what you just explained is so fundamental to understanding. Though if you go back to the conventional world and ask them what fun means in their life, entertainment means, it is one of these five things. Mm, mm, yes, true, 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 true. <laughs> How to encourage this world to get entertained, abstaining from this, hmm. than trying to get to this point. So there we have to explain to them the dangers of doing this, the shame of doing this, right? Or what will, you will get back as do. So therefore, in a way, these precepts, Bhante, has got deviated in many of the teachings that we share with these people hmm. in society. Hmm. It is true that the Buddha said that they need to know the precept, they need to know the dangers of this, mm. the consequences you will have if mm. you do so, uh, and they must have a level of shame to, to, to be doing this. Mm. Yeah? Mm. So, you know. Hiri otapa. Hiri otapa, yeah. So, mm. constantly you have to encourage with the sealer, 
fear of wrongdoing because of the fear of the consequences and then this is something external because it's usually the the retribution comes from the external world then there's this is shame uh, which i think we can also uh, talk about like bad consciousness is something internal that when the self the so-called self looks at itself having done something uh, bad then it hurts it it is so see i, I shouldn't have done it Uh, how could I do that? How how so it feels very bad about itself, uh, and this is uh, something uh, that has to be present. Shamelessness is something that is uh, basically the opposite. And I think uh, if I look at the Western world, in particular regarding sexual behavior and uh, the use of pornography, uh, then this shamelessness that is now is kind of like blatant, basically, is blown out uh, everywhere. Uh, also in plastic surgery in getting big boobs and right lips and uh, using false hair and so forth this shamelessness is 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 blatant is blatant because of what because of wrong view one thinks ah it has no consequence it has no consequence to have no shame and also because of christianity that shame uh, and uh, and doing wrong in in christianity kind of like has has been ditched out it is not something that, that one should be shameful about anything one can do exactly as one likes is the nihilist will say huh it's an it's an there's an open door yes but, but is it also an open door to hurt yourself both karmically and to hurt your neighbor and to hurt others uh, and hurt your future that's what the door is open for so i think uh, the buddha say he's very right when he say are ah, these two things fear of wrongdoing and shame is the protectors of the world yeah. it's the only protectors of the world it is not something disciplinary that somebody is a judge is then banging on your head ah you must not do this and then i will punish you no 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 because the punishment comes by itself automatically so and you cannot run away from it huh? so it's more like a protection it's two umbrellas that 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 it keeps away suffering raining on you from your own actions yeah. so this is where i think as a completely other thing it's not a disciplinarian judgmental uh, coming from outside thing that uh, that restrict your personal freedom no it's just very very rational because it's based on cause and effect advice about what to do and what not to do mm. and if one aligns one's fear at one doing and shame which is something that is very emotional coming from inside then one one naturally improves one's behavior so the behavior naturally will affect a more pl- pleasant and successful a higher level future while if one gives it up that i think to some extent the hedonistic pleasure seeking uh, not only western world but world in in general but uh, today it has taken a, a an extreme uh, an extreme push because there's a whole industry there entertainment industry porn industry food industry uh, tourism industry that is pushing 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 harder than ever with advertisement uh 24 hours a day wherever you look in in the internet there will be advertisement plastered all over wherever you go in the world there will be advertisement for all these places then it's difficult to keep on this shame and fear of wrongdoing in not going around and picking among these temptations right? and saying this are this innocent that to pick along whatever temptation there is that inherently will ha- have some degree of killing or stealing or or uh, deceiving in it either directly or indirectly huh? so i think the buddha is very wise to say ah we have to begin with that and i think also it's important for the western buddhist in your two settings in the singara then it's very grounded that sila it starts with sila it starts with moral purity but i think there's many western buddhist that thinks ah i can reach enlightenment but i don't need to uh, follow the rules of the game i don't need to have any uh, ma- any moral purity huh i can induce i can uh, make up uh, whatever moral rules uh, myself 
So it's something relative. It's something cultural. No, 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 no. It's something universal, basically. And and and, and one of the uh, one of the reasons, Bhante, that the, this Bhante sees that the Western world, right, that has a certain Christian uh, upbringing, why they feel this way, is that in the prayer, Lord's prayer, there are two lines that says, uh, "Lead me not into temptation." But deliver me out of evil. This evilness that we each person has, and the temptation of craving that we have, is handed over to a third person somewhere to deal with. Hmm. So therefore, if I am having whatever the evil inside me to harm another, to destroy what is another's, take something that is another, do whatever with another, is is because. The third person hasn't done whatever they are supposed to do. Mm. You see, mm. and, and if I'm tempted, wait, oh no, it's their responsibility to deal with it. Mm. So we are constantly contradictory. So you mean, so for example, if you like to eat chicken, then uh, it becomes the butcher's uh, duty or function to serve you chicken, and thereby you inherently come to to participate in the killing of the butcher. Uh, or whatever place you're seeking it is. Exactly. But but not only the, the Lord's prayer is that you hand the responsibility to a Lord. Yeah. Right? So in the Lord's prayer you say, you know, lead me not into temptation, deliver me out of evil. So these two lines, in a way, you know, hand certain responsibilities to a third party. Hmm. So because ah, okay, okay. He's 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 responsible for your deliverance from evil. Yes, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. The, and your absence of temptation. Well, this is how this Bhante has interpreted yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not wrong? Yeah. No. 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 Not necessarily. <laughs> so, 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 so I, I, I look at myself and says, "Wow! Suddenly, coming to the Dhamma, I have control. Mm. I am able to control my temptations. Mm. I don't need a third person." Mm. I don't need to ask a third person. Mm. Do you think actually that it is even possible for a third person to control your temptation to deliver you from evil? Well, I was made to believe that uh, in the, your in your Christian upbringing. Oh, I, 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 yeah, in, in whatever the upbringing that I was exposed to, I was made to believe that 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 that, that is how it is. But I, I know that anger is, is nothing because it's driven by me. Mm. So I, I, this one day is able to say. No, don't go do that. Mm, mm, mm. So you're responsible. Exactly. Uh, so I, I've taken responsibility of myself. Mm, mm. I'm not going to give it to third person anymore. No, 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 no. And no. this is what this monkhood is about. Yeah. So uh, also, if you connect a little bit back, so this hiri otaba, this shame and fear of wrongdoing, has this been instrumental for you to see? Ah, uh, I'm responsible for myself. I take upon responsibility for myself in all actions. Is this is this a a important factor. Definitely, one thing. Uh, yeah. But the moment you leave it in the in the hands of a third person, uh, then you're not. Now, I, I would go this far, one day. If, as a lay person, I was given a name, I didn't choose that. It was chosen for me. Hmm. So I asked, who is responsible for that name? And those who gave it to me hmm. are part responsible. Hmm. I only have part responsibility to perform in it. So I don't take all the responsibility with the name. No, 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 no. no, no, no. Yeah. So now that I've relinquished that name that was given by my parents, yeah. and I've taken up a name of my own upbringing now yeah, of yeah, the Dhamma, yeah, yeah. and it's my responsibility yeah. to live what this dham, this name means. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm ashamed yeah. to tarnish this name. Yeah, yeah, true, true. I wouldn't do anything. No, no. Yeah. I would but, just like to expand a little bit on it. It's just to say, if you leave it to third person, so uh, the, if you leave it to third, third person, then the, the whole effect of consumerism, which has deleterious effect uh, on the world, uh, on large scale, huh, it becomes actually the producer. Huh? It, it becomes the porn producer, the food producer, the plastic producer. But, but, but it's you who are enjoying it. So, so, so one yeah. is this transaction that you now see, Bante, right? Mm. The consumer mm. is one thing. Mm. Right? The, the person who delivers it. Mm. Now you ask them, why are you producing? They'll say, there's a demand. Right? A Lord asked me to do so. Right? Mm. Ultimately, it is still in a third person's hand. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, nobody yeah. wants to take responsibility. Why? Mm. Of what they produced. Mm. It's justified. Mm. And economic reasons and economy is Lord. Mm. Ecological reasons is Lord.
forward. Mm. And, 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 and this is how this delusion of science is continued. Mm. But you say, from, seeing from a Buddhist point of view and Dharma point of view, then it is when you make a choice, uh, whether it's in the cooling disc of, of, of the, the supermarket or whether it's to step into a car or not step into a car, there is this fear and wrongdoing really taking its action. Definitely. Uh, that's where it, it counts. Huh? <laughs> and this is because you realize that since it's me who make the choice, it is also me who has to enjoy or not enjoy the effect of the choice. Right. Uh, and I cannot run away from it. And I cannot uh, victimize myself and say somebody else did it. Huh? So Even not the producer of the aeroplane or the producer of the chicken or whatever it is, or of the entertainment. They, they, they <laughs> well, they have their own, <laughs> their own game, their own future, but it's still me choosing it or not choosing it. Yeah. Huh? So, the, so, so, so now, now coming to, to the Dhamma is one thing. Coming to uh, the robes as a bhikkhu is a further thing. And in the this thing, we have rules as a Dasa, Dasa, Dasa Dhamma Sutta, the 10 elements that we should consider all the time mm. and always make sure that, that we, are, we are different to the laity. So, shops are not for you, it's for the laity. Mm. So, don't go shopping. Mm. So, now, even if the need arises, you must know how to deal with that need. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So, in that way, one thing, there is enough for a monk to be and have nothing to do with society. Mm. Though they are dependent on society to sustain themselves mm. up in the path. Mm. And generosity will provide for that. Mm. So, when you live by these, these Dasadama Sutta and the Pati Moksha and whatever, something happens inside to bring that hiriyot up, that, that, that shamefulness, that fearfulness associated because you are not following it in that way. Now, what we have to, what we are talking about is this lay, lay community that has been caught up in this unnecessary marketed world mm. okay it doesn't matter what the commodity is one day mm. yeah it is just what it is mm. now uh, this pante was recently spoken to and said pante don't you think that the buddha should have brought a precept about sugar mm. abstain from taking sugar mm. not just alcohol mm. why sugar is poison mm. But sugar is just a commodity. But sugar comes from cane. Eating cane is okay. But the commodity, the extract of it, and the production of sugar is out of it is maybe poisonous. Mm. Right? But ultimately, we just have to understand how to survive with what is being gifted to us. Mm -hmm. yeah? It's a luxury actually compared to the lay lives. So true. So yeah. This month, I feel so, so, so sympathetic to this wider world that is going through this exerted exhaustion mm. trying to find fun mm. trying to find entertainment trying to fulfill some responsibility for another person mm. that they think they are responsible for mm. right? while being seduced oh, uh, raped by this uh, with samsara huh? so uh, true uh, there's diversity and extreme quicker this world is able to slow down and if one person in this society opens their eyes and step aside, giving way to the other. So, um, I think we should cover a little land about here, about our visions about the Dhamma. What is your, uh, what do you think will happen and what is your vision of how the Dhamma will be integrated? In the, now we have 2,500 years left of the, of, of the Sangha. Huh? of the sasana. Huh? So this I can just say for prediction that uh, the sasana will last this time 5,000 years and it have, have already lasted 2,500 years. So we expect from the text, from the predictions, that it will last 2,500 years more. What is your vision for these next 2,500 years? <laughs> Big question. <coughs> uh, this Bhante would want to say that his vision is about his personal journey first. And greater the accomplishment in my personal development, greater would it be that, that he could offer something to the sasana and to those who are following the sasana. Uh, the way the uh, other belief systems are gathering momentum, the way the world and the way the world is governed, the politics, the uh, governances, the extremism, the popularism, 
you know, all these things have a major part to play than enlightenment. So, if you take a list of accomplishments in this society, in this world that we are living in today, enlightenment doesn't make any list. No, <laughs> it is uh, not even there uh, yeah. to some extent. Yeah. Eh? So, uh, in an environment in that way, for us to be mere mortals of humble individuals as who we are, but to reach out to those one, two individuals who are fortunate even to hear this discussion going on. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, this one they would be the most happiest. So we are taking part in it already, uh, your vision already now. Exactly. But yeah, there yeah. is no other vision that we should have other than to encourage any person in any form to live some of these words of the Buddha. Yeah, live the Dhamma. And reap the benefit by their the actions, mm. their, by their performance. Mm. Not because we have said. No, no, no. Ultimately, Bhante, just because you and I eat something doesn't mean other people out there and their hunger mm. has gone away. Mm. No. Mm. No, true. Their hunger goes away if they serve themselves mm. and eat something. So Eat the Dhamma. Practice the Dhamma. What you and I in this little discussion is doing is the vision for the future. Mm. Is to serve this, serve this with this media, serve this in, in whatever way that we can that reaches out to those that are awakened, mm. that have the fortune to listen to this discussion. To be able to understand. E even if understand whatever they can understand. Yeah, yeah. Day, uh. yeah? But to first even before they understand, ask themselves this simple question. Why am I the way I am? And many of what we were talking about will just get exposed because you will be opening what that Pandora's box is about inside. Mm, mm, so, mm. Very conflicting, and, very confusing. Exactly. Mm. It's a very frightening thing to open, but mm. it doesn't matter. Just mm. to open it up. Mm. Yeah. What has these skeletons coming out the cupboard? What escapes out of it? Mm. It's just escape and be happy that it escaped. Mm. What gets stuck, you have to clean it out. Mm. So that's a tougher job. <laughs> <laughs> a big cleaning job, especially yeah. on the moral ethical side. Yes. I would also like to add, uh, before we, we end up here, that uh, if I look at one factor in my this is 16 years of uh, life in the Sangha, uh, as one connecting factor and one joy I, uh, I time and time again, even uh, today also in particular, then is this Dhamma sharing. So uh, for me it has been to see, ah, now I have come, I have found something very, very precious. There is something very difficult to find. Actually, many times in the text when there's no Buddha, it is mentioned that the kings, he sent out a treasure on an elephant. Uh, and a, a person who bangs a drum and say, ah, whoever can mention four lines of Dhamma, they will get the kingdom and they will get also the treasures on, the, on this elephant. But sometimes and often it's, it's more often than not that there will be centuries, millennia, whole universe will pass where you cannot find four lines of Dhamma. Now we are so lucky that a Buddha has been here, actually four has been in this universe, one more is, will still come. The Dhamma is here, uh, the text is there, uh, everything he said, the Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, the last one, everything he said is still, is still present among us. The opportunity to train, I think, is fairly good because uh, we are not, we are not uh, preoccupied with uh, producing food like they were in the old days. They have to be in the field all the time. But we can go and, uh, and buy it in the supermarket fairly easily. So we are not preoccupied with food. We are very busy with other things. But the possibility to train the Dhamma is really there. So this, for me, this Dhamma sharing, that is giving out this, uh, this option for other beings to say, ah, really, absolute happiness, complete peace, and the highest happiness of Nirvana, Nirvana is an option I can take also in my personal life. And then I will feel another level of meaning and sense uh, and rationality in what I'm doing. Uh, and also, uh, I feel a lot of joy and pleasure, and other beings will do it too. So it's a it's a middle way of harmony, I would say, that goes towards peace. And this peace I have felt in large doses, and also a joy of this dharma sharing that we have been doing now for several hours has also filled me for a, more than a decade. 
So I'm happy. I like to say thank you, Dabba Gavese, that you. Yes, we came far around. Actually, I didn't uh, speculate much about the question, but I think we have covered a lot of ground. Uh, so I also like to say thank you to you for your advantageous attention, for your clever consideration, and for your kind contribution. And may you indeed, by these words of the Dhamma here from Frederikshund in Denmark, a day in June, be peaceful and happy. Thank you. Friends, the Four Noble Truth, Chachari Arya Sachani, which is the very core of Buddhism, are one. All this and such is suffering, dukkha, true, craving, is the cause of all suffering, Dukkha Samudaya. 3. Absence of all craving is the end of all suffering, Dukkha Niroda. 4. The Noble Eightfold Way leads to the end of all suffering, Dukkha Niroda Kamni Pratibhada. The Noble Eightfold Way leading to Nibbana is simply this. Right view, samaditi. Right motivation, samma sankapa. Right speech, samma raja. Right action, samma kamanda. Right livelihood, samma ajiva. Right effort, samma vajama. Right awareness, samma sati. And right concentration, samma samadhi. But what is Right livelihood. What is this critical right livelihood? The fivefold definition of right livelihood is 1. Earning a living not involving any trading with living beings. 2. Earning a living not involving any selling of meat, fish, or flesh. 3. Earning a living not involving any selling of any form of weapons. 4. Earning a living not involving any dealing with alcohol or illegal drugs. 5. Earning a living not involving any selling of any form of poison. That is right livelihood. The characterization of right livelihood for lay people is as follows. Any livelihood that neither involves any killing, injuring, harming, nor any forced imprisoning of any living being, nor stealing, taking what is not giving, cheating, any bribery or corruption or lying or false deceiving, tricks or for use of false measures or weights, neither any sensual nor any sexual abuse, neither the use of selling of alcohol nor of intoxicating illegal drugs that causes carelessness, neither by oneself, nor by getting, nor inciting others, employees, to do so. Such is right livelihood. And right livelihood for Buddhist monks and nuns, the monastic Sangha, is neither living by receiving food by astrology, soothsaying, prediction of future events, nor by palmistry, Geomancy, dream reading, charms or spells, amulets or fake divination, nor by any rituals, running errands or messages, political flatter, arranging marriages, funerals or divorces, nor by medical practice, nor by producing art, poetry, or in professional disputation or debate. That is right livelihood. For further study on Buddhist right livelihood, Sama Ajiva, go to whatbuddhaset.net and search for what is right livelihood. Thank you for your attention, consideration, and contribution. And have a nice.